back. WNST, Toss in Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We have not had a lot of this, the Baltimore sports stuff, to talk about. Luke Jones, I, you know, for a night on Thursday night as sort of weird and disjointed and basemented and uh, booing on behalf of Bud Light, um, you know, was... Kind of a weird Thursday night, and so weird that at the end of the night, the Ravens did something that they've never done at 11.40 p.m. I mean, they, they picked their own pick, which is like crazy. They picked the pick that I would have mocked to them, and I think I did in the afternoon, and others did. I mean, it was almost like a script down the middle. I mean, the Dolphins tanked for Tua and even got him. Uh, what a weird Friday morning to wake up to, and I know we have a couple more days of draft. I've got I've got a a chicken marinating today that we're gonna bake up tonight. I've got beer on ice. I've got all these things happening out there, and paying tribute to my late great friend Johnny Bev as I drink the last bottle of wine he ever picked out for me uh, this weekend. So I want to give a little tribute and, and, and tip the cap to him, but. Uh, you know, we're one day into this, and I, you know, if you're a Ravens fan, you wake up, you fell asleep like I did in the middle of the draft, and you'd say, all right, well, you know, that's script to the Ravens, and, you know, here we go, and I hope we do play football in the fall, right? Like, there's something to be excited about, right? It's what we said at the beginning of the week. It's hope. It's a thought toward the future, whether we're just talking about September or whether we're talking about who knows when. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of uncertainty, but what was certain and what became apparent uh, after you know, some, some very serious questions as far as how they would have the draft, where it would be, when it would be. Uh, and I think you have to give the league, I think you have to give ESPN and NFL Network a lot of credit. This went off pretty seamlessly. And I think for the Ravens, you kind of buried the lead the first time in 25 years, which is just crazy when you think about that. The first time the Ravens have ever drafted a player from LSU. LSU, we're not talking about some mid-major Mac or Mountain West school or something like that. First time they've drafted They took a him. Maryland guy in the first draft in Jermaine Lewis, right? So. Exactly. <laughs> so they draft uh, LSU linebacker Patrick Queen. Uh, certainly someone, as you just mentioned, who uh, was linked to them quite a bit, along with Kenneth Murray from Oklahoma. Uh, at the inside linebacker position. And he but, popped late, right? Yeah, yeah. But but I think it, it, it's always interesting when you're picking as late as the Ravens picked, especially this year, being at 28. I mean, it's one thing if you're 20, 25, 16, 17, like they were a few, a few years back. And I was hoping for 32, by the way. Of course. Uh, I think everyone was, and uh, Kansas City had that distinction on Thursday night. But when you're picking so late, it really is difficult to really – pin down who you think you're going to come away with. I mean, you might have a, a, a short list, but even Eric DaCosta, there's, there's going to be uncertainty there. And I think even with this year, with no pro days, you didn't have nearly the opportunities for coaches and scouts around the league to you know, they exchange notes very informally. I mean, they don't give away their secrets, but they certainly want to kind of feel out what other teams feel about prospects. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's a time where sometimes you'll talk about potential players the, the Ravens will pick, and they'll be gone 15 spots before the Ravens even pick. I mean, it's not even a discussion. So for this to work out the, in the way that it did, uh, and when you looked at how things were going in the 20s, you know, Chasen goes off the board, Justin Jefferson, Kenneth Murray, Cesar Ruiz, you're, you're kind of looking at it and you're saying, Oh, is Patrick Queen still going to be there? And there were a lot of guys that were at, that were thought to be after the Ravens pick. I didn't see Ruiz going much up in the teens, right? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I saw quite. him as being sort of one of the the backdrop guys if all the linebackers were gone or whatever, right? Sure, I, you saw him as a late first or early second type talent, uh, and, and even with Seattle, I mean, I think there was a lot. Of, there were expectations that the Seahawks were going to take Patrick Queen. They end up taking Jordan Brooks, the linebacker from Texas Tech, who it appears the league liked a little bit more than the, dra the mock draft pundits. And hey, the kid from Wisconsin still sitting there, you know, as we speak, right? Oh, no question. Uh, and that's what's exciting about day two for the Ravens with two second-round picks, two third-round picks. I mean, there are some good players left on the board, but Patrick Queen, it's tough not to draw some really easy comparisons. A 20-year-old undersized 
inside linebacker late in the first round to the Baltimore Ravens. I don't need to tell you. I know where you're going with this. Yeah, but the difference. I'm wearing the hat. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, a much uh, much more defined uh, ball cap that he can wear. But I went with I, my I, Ogden look here. I wasn't thinking Ray Ray as much as I was thinking J.O., you know, for a throwback. But Yeah, there you go. Hey, uh, it's the 25th draft in Ravens history. But uh, I think the nice thing with uh, Patrick Queen, unlike Ray Lewis, who stepped into a defense that had very little talent, uh, and he was you know, kind of a one-man show with apologies to a couple guys like Eric Turner uh, in that first year. I mean, this is a guy coming <laughs> into a really talented really talented defense, and I think it was evident in the playoff loss to Tennessee when they gave up two, over 200 yards rushing. We talked about the front seven from the time the season ended. We were talking about it at the end of last season as far as relative weaknesses uh, that a 14-2 and two football team had. It, it was to beef up the front seven. Well, they did that with Calais Campbell and Derek Wolf uh, with a trade and a free agent acquisition, and their first pick in the 2020 draft they shore up their inside linebacker group that, frankly, needed another one. L.J. Fort, nice, but more of a situational sub-package guy. Uh, I think Patrick Queen should have every opportunity to be a three-down inside linebacker. Uh, very athletic. Uh, yeah, the, the, the size is a question, but the Ravens just spent uh, some significant resources beefing up the defensive line, so you hope that helps him, uh, at least early on. And Unlike some, some of the issues they had last year, this is a kid who can cover. And he played some of his absolute best football uh, against an Oklahoma, uh, against a Clemson. So he played some stout competition, even though he only had one full year as a starter at LSU. So uh, I, think, I think the pick was a no-brainer. I like it. You never really know until the kid gets out on the field and, and makes the adjustments to the next level. But there are a lot of reasons to think Patrick Queen can be uh, a guy that it can be a difference maker at the inside linebacker position, which, let's face it, they, they were able to make it work last year, but they didn't get a whole lot of that at inside linebacker last season. Luke Jones is here. He is Baltimore. Luke, uh, of course, covering all things. And if there's a pick, a trade, a move, a back, a fourth, an up, a down, wherever it is, you'll not only get it on Twitter, you'll also get it on their WNST text service. All, of course, brought to you by Coons Ford Security Boulevard. Dennis Colazos will be here on Monday. So we have live coverage Monday morning beginning at 8 a.m. Luke and I will be together be, at 7 a.m. Uh, you will hear from Bruce Posner at 8 a.m. in September talk. Dennis will be here from 9 until 11. Peter DeLutis will be around as well. There will be full draft coverage all weekend long at WNST.net and Baltimore Positive and in our morning newspaper uh, and of course out in the buyatoyota.com audio vault as well. So we have all this stuff going on. I want to give a shout out to a whole bunch of our sponsors around here because we talk up uh, you know, our friends at Fadley's and State Fair and all the Baltimore Positive programming. Uh, we're going to have Scott Schellenberger, Brian Frosch. You can find that stuff out uh, at our WNSTV channel. We're we're mixing and matching a lot of stuff, but really doing a ton of football this weekend and catching up as much as uh, uh, Eric DaCosta had even a little bit of sense of humor uh, about the football thing. I think us taking a deep dive and me putting the Raven hat on and the bird logo. Uh, Luke, it does feel good, right? I mean, it would feel a lot better at a sports bar right now if we could get together and you know have a crab cake over at Costas or whatnot and uh, uh, chat over at Al Seafood hit me up and said he's looking forward to getting this thing. He was supposed to have uh, Robert Irvine in his place this week on Monday night, so he's doing a big charity thing uh, next week as well, so I'm hearing things, telling stories about what's going on in the city, but the backdrop is, this is the one little thing on Thursday night, right, where you open a beer, I had some pasta, I got some sausage, you know, I got some Roma sausage to kind of feel local about this, and threw some peppers and onions together and said, you know what, I'm going to sit and watch the draft, and it was really weird. It was disjointed. It was nice seeing Kuiper uh, and hearing his voice. Um, but, but you know, no crossing the stage. All the kids sort of looked like they were with their parents or their family, not six feet apart, on a couch with a dog, with a girlfriend, whatever. Um, I, but from a, a draft perspective, to sit and watch it, it, you know, maybe the only normal thing I've done in the last six weeks, man. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, over the last week, I can think of three things that I've done that felt at all normal. One was mowing my lawn, <laughs> and the other two were uh, the Michael Jordan documentary kicking off last Sunday night 
uh, on ESPN, which, uh, as you saw, got some crazy numbers for just a documentary. Got numbers that a, a live game, you know, a playoff game kind of gets. The kind of numbers that Chris uh, Chris Piker's Twitter feed right now is getting, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, as you mentioned, the NFL draft. I mean, was it different? Absolutely. Were, th- were there some weird factors to it? No question about it. But, uh, again, I, I really have to praise uh, the league and the networks. And, uh, and I like the fact that ESPN and NFL Network you know, they work together on this. I mean, why, why, why use separate resources when this is such an unprecedented kind of a, event where, I mean, you just think about all the, the movers and shakers in the league uh, involved with this, from Roger Goodell on down to their IT people. Uh, you have all of the different teams, talking owners, GMs, coaches, and all of their people that maybe didn't have the same kind of voice as they normally would when you're in your traditional war room at your team facility. Uh, And then, uh, of course, you had all the players. You had all the media uh, around the league covering it. So it was quite an endeavor. So to be able to put on the kind of production that they did with very few hiccups, uh, I mean, if, if we're being really fair about that, you know, if you're putting your media critic hat on, you know, it was fairly seamless. I mean, there, there weren't a whole lot of technical glitches. I mean, there were a couple here and there. But from that standpoint, it was nice because it, it did feel like the draft, a different version of the draft, but it, it wasn't like some other things that I've witnessed where, you know, you know, like pro wrestling, for example, where uh, I've watched r- wrestling events with no fans, where fan interaction is so uh, so critical to that forum uh, even without having you know, the stage in Los Angeles or New York or Dallas or wherever it's been in recent years, uh, you, you still had the feeling that, oh, th- there's a live shot of the kid and his family, and, uh, and there's a, a shot of the GM. You know, he, he's not high-fiving his head coach, but he's high-fiving his kids. You know? so, so there were, there were a lot of kids on laps, you know what yeah, I mean? Like Eric DaCosta's wife and I are Facebook friends, and I, I saw their pregame spread, and I said, you know, I'll stay six feet away if you give me one of those wings and one of those crab cakes, you know yeah. what I mean? But, you know, I think it was a little bit of a family Super Bowl, right, yeah. kind of thing for not having friends and family and cousins over, but something that... Look, anybody who's quarantined with whomever you're quarantined, I mean, it's me and my wife and my cat, right? And it's you and your brother. And it, this time in our lives, whoever we're with, this was the one night we all sat around and watched The Wizard of Oz, right? Like, um, and there's not much of that that brings people together anymore, right? No, there isn't. So uh, to, to have that, and again, we'll have plenty of time to talk about whether there'll be a season, where, how it'll be played, when it'll be played, et cetera. I mean, <laughs> We're not going anywhere, so uh, you know. So Dude, I would have been in Vegas. Like the more I think about, you know, having I was supposed to go out to the West Coast over the weekend. Yeah, you know, not? I I would have gotten a credential and said, you know what, I'm going to go see because um, I'm not going to go again. I mean, I haven't gone to the draft since I got this hat in 1996, right? I I told Dennis that the other day before the draft. I said, yeah, I went the first year up to New York, and it wasn't like fun it's it was yeah. more fun to be at the barn you know it was more fun to be at Bedonia station when they drafted Terrell Suggs and traded up for Kyle Bowler right like I remember where I was standing at the the port when Haloti Nato was drafted you know you remember where you were and who you were with and the beer you were drinking and the time of your life and you have pictures or whatever you have at this point this is the one where I, you know I think everyone will remember this one because hopefully, you know, they will go back to Vegas and there'll be a quarter million people and I, I probably won't go unless Pearl Jam's playing somewhere near there this time next year. Uh, we'll do a re- redo in 21, right? But I, I don't know that that thing will ever come to Baltimore. I guess it will, right? I mean, I guess it'll be a circus once we fix the city here and figure out, you know, how we screwed up the Keith Urban thing a few years ago. Um, maybe we, we would do that here in Baltimore, and that would be a momentous thing for Baltimore in 2026 if we fixed all this and we remember back and, you know, this kid from LSU comes in and wins a trophy here with Lamar two years from now or whatever, right? Like, we could look back and say, I remember where we were when that kid was drafted, and 
look, the, 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 we're, we're on the mall in D.C. now, right? And the Redskins are still picking second. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I, I think this will mark a different kind of draft for all of us, for this kid, for that moment, for anybody that marks time in the way that I pulled out my John Ogden hat uh, that he handed me coming off the stage. It had a little bit of dust in it. Um, from 96 to say these drafts mark time in the same way opening day does in the same way the Super Bowl does in the same way whatever those things in your life are the draft has become that thing I mean come on dude we none of us have missed a draft in 23 years right 24 years. exactly I mean it's a checkpoint if you're a I tell you what fan. we did miss we missed an opening day right we missed a World Series in our life you know we've missed a lot of things they didn't miss the draft this time yeah right? yeah I mean it's uh, it was something that we were able to still experience differently uh, certainly differently uh, you know it, it was very strange for me I mean this is the first time I've watched a draft in my own home since 2010, 2011, somewhere in that there in that territory. I mean, I've been at the Ravens facility. So, did you still get a question on DaCosta? I, I didn't get one in on DaCosta. I did. I did ask Patrick Queen uh, what he thought about the fact that he was the first player from LSU the Ravens have ever drafted. And face it, the Ravens are a quarter century old now. I mean, that's how many players is it? So, let me let me do the math. Hold on, twenty three years. I would say they've averaged seven to eight players. So, I think they have drafted one hundred and ninety players. Am I right or wrong? Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know off the top of my. Oh, head, I thought you would. You're, you're right, such a numbers a nerd. I figured. Yeah, you we're would. not talking of. This isn't a five year sampling of, of yeah, thirty players. I mean, it's you're, you're in the hundreds. Uh, so, and, and we're not talking about some obscure, you know, some one double A school that just went to the. FBS level in the last five years. I mean, this is LSU. This is a powerhouse. Uh, so, but but it, it was interesting, and you know, he he was on the Zoom chat, and you, know, you could hear a dog barking in the background, and you know, he had. You know, did you ask him what kind of dog he has, or no? No, no, I, that did not come up. Well, hold I think. on, let's. I'm going to look that up on Twitter. I'm At sure he's got a picture of his dog. <laughs> if he's, a, I mean, he's the kind of guy I want on my team. He better have. I mean, Eric dacosta has got a picture of his dog up. You know. <laughs> But but at that point, uh, you know, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of one one thirty something like that. So I think those people on the call were uh, trying to you know, just get the essential information and then uh, <laughs> call it a night and finish writing and go to bed. But but you know, I, I think no, I mean this is exciting. And again, a kid from a big time program. Uh, it's interesting because you do typically associate the Ravens with college players who have a ton of production, whereas Patrick Queen, because he played uh, at LSU that's had some really stout defenses in recent years, he didn't become a full-time starter until this past season. But again, you look at how he played, especially in the second half of the season, uh, against an Oklahoma, uh, against a Clemson. Now, he was defensive MVP in the championship. I mean, he, you know, this is a kid who really played his absolute best football uh, against the top competition, and hey, you want that because you know the competition is going to be that much more impressive at the next level. So uh, I think he you know, feels like he'll be a good fit. Uh, he's very young. I think that's important to remember, uh, both in terms of 2020 or immediate future and also understanding upside and, and the ceiling he could have. So uh, I think, you know, hey, end of the first round, you're always going to have some questions here and there. But, uh, again, for the value for how he was regarded around the league and how you, know, how you saw everyone react to that pick. And considering the Ravens didn't even have to move up to do it, I think you have to feel really good about it. Now it's just a matter of when you can get him into the building, just like the rest of your players right now, and you know, when that's going to happen. I, don't, I have no idea, but uh, yeah, I think uh, the Ravens will like what they see when that day does come. I've been looking on his uh, Twitter. I can't find a picture of his dog here. I may have to tweet at him and <laughs> Maybe ask him. it was him. his parents' dog. Who knows? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, we all love animals around here. So, I mean, you know, you mentioned the dog was barking. I mean, who let the dogs out, right? Uh, Luke is here. He is Baltimore Luke. You can find him. Luke at WNST.net. We're out on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of these places. We are keeping very calm and staying very local, doing lots and lots of business stuff up at Baltimore Positive and now taking a little deeper dive into the football stuff. We're going to continue that here through the weekend and, of course, on Monday. 
Bruce Posner will be here live from 8 till 9 with Turp Talk and special Ravens Talk, uh, as well as Dennis Colazzo's from 9 to 11 with a special edition of the Dennis Colazzo Show. You can follow him all weekend. No one's tweeting like D. Colazzo Show, as well as Luke and myself uh, on the couch, eating wings, caffeinating, writing, opining, and uh, trying to bring together uh, the best we can do with Baltimore Positive these days. Please go out and support all of our sponsors. Planet Fitness is doing a workout every night at 7 o'clock. I'm going to be talking to some PF folks here, including Victor Brick. Uh, you can find that out uh, at WNST.net. Victor and I, unbelievable conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago about keeping your mind sharp during all of this. And we've talked so much about that. Also with Patty Moeller, Don Moeller's sister, who is a psychotherapist. Uh, just keeping your head together during this. My wife's doing a lot of yoga, staying, staying sharp. Want to make sure our, our Planet Fitness folks get the love that they deserve. I know Luke's doing push-ups up in Pennsylvania as well. Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. I poured the uh, Kona blend into, I got the extended coal roofing mug. Anybody sees Billy Cole, I'll tell him, and he knows what I'm up against here. We're going to go large mug for a hundred years of, uh, of coffee here and deliciousness. I'm eating cookies on the air, getting it all, making a mess over here. I have not had Pizza John's, crinkle fries, gravy, steak sub, provolone cheese, ravioli. I haven't had any of that since the pandemic began. And I'm going to change that soon. I'm going to get to Essex soon. I talked to Chad at Al Seafood. He's got a big thing going on I'm going to be promoting. Uh, We lost Johnny Bev at King Discount Liquors last weekend. My wife came flying into the studio on Monday morning, told me about it, and Rita and Paul and uh, all of our loved ones over King Liquors. um, I don't even know what to say. Uh, You know, Johnny Bev's uh, a real dude in my life and Picked out a lot of beverages. We talked about tequila. We talked about red wine and Cabernet and Malbec and um, and Pinot, which I don't love. He knows that. <laughs> I think he's the one that got me into uh, the, the Petite Syrah and said, you're going to like that, and I did. So I hear that in his voice. And um, we had an inside joke with Johnny Bev about sake that we did during the Olympics. I did one of the crazy TV commercials that'll probably cost me any election I ever run for. Um, But we, we, we had fun with the Olympics and doing Olympics and gold medals. And, uh, he had Saki, and, and, and it was just the funniest thing. And we've had so much fun with him. So, uh, my heart goes out to anyone that loved Johnny Beverotti and, uh, the curly friends, the, uh, the friars, So much love to everybody out there, and um, thinking of you, Johnny Bev. So uh, we'll come back. we got more draft coverage. Luke and I are together. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570. Staying Baltimore positive, keeping calm, staying local, and drinking the wine of Johnny Bev here at WNST.